Welcome to the Love Island podcast. In this show, we chat to leaders, influencers, business owners, and organizations who are passionate about Ireland and Irish tourism. Join us and listen to the conversation where leaders in Irish tourism will share their stories, advice, and opinions. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram TV, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. Good day, everyone, and welcome back to Love Ireland. Today, I'm speaking to Alan Byrne. Alan is a tour operator in Dublin um, with the company AB Tours. Welcome to Love Ireland, Alan. Thanks, Will. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Alan, um, would you mind telling our listeners a bit about yourself and um, how you started your business journey? How did you end up doing tours in um, Dublin? I was working throughout uh, the years 2000 and seven up till 2017 in a hardware shop i kind of ended up doing that by accident i didn't particularly like it and i got the opportunity to go back to university as a mature student so i went uh, to study history i did quite well on the course and i was encouraged to stay on and do a master's but the uh, funding model for doing a master's didn't really work with the job i was in so i figured since that i had an undergrad degree in history I might try and apply that to some work which I could use to support my master's. So I reached out to some friends of mine who had been working in tour guiding. I thought I'd give it a go, maybe do it for a year and see where it went. But once I began doing guiding, uh, I really, really loved it. It was just great to apply uh, things that I'd studied uh, as a degree and get paid for it. Uh, I had planned to progress through academia, but uh, just hit some further stumbling blocks. So I decided that I'm going to try and uh, just work for myself as a guide. A lot of the guiding that you do over here is sort of freelance work. So I had done a number of different jobs for some different companies. Most of the time I was with one company as well, but the model for those kind of tours is tips-based. It can vary. You can have a great day, you can have a terrible day. So what we're trying to do uh, is myself just start uh, working on, under my own name, try and build up a, a bit of a recognition for myself as a guide, and just sort of be in control of the tours that I do myself. So uh, I spent the last year doing a course with Falcher Ireland, they're the tourist board, and they have a sort of a national accreditation system. So I've, uh, I got that passed there last weekend as well. So I'm gonna use that as a platform to try and advertise myself. Uh, in the future. Oh, that's awesome. AB Tours haven't been in operation for a long time. Uh, no, I only started it uh, about seven or eight months ago, really. It, again, it was just a sort of a loose idea just to get my own name out there and just to operate independently. My long-term plan would be to uh, start a new company with similar like-minded guides, people who have been working in the field for quite a long time, but maybe want to have a bit of ownership over uh, how they control tours and how they operate as well. So I'm kind of talking to people about expanding uh, in, in a kind of collective organization with some other guides. So Alan, when somebody plans to come to um, Ireland, um, what do you suggest? How long would they actually need to plan their trip? And you know, uh, how, do you, how do you go about planning a trip in Ireland? If say, for instance, you're sitting in the US in, and you need information, you want to start. Do people contact a person like you or would they go on the internet? How does that work? There's a number of different approaches. Uh, you can travel with a tour operator. In that case, you're getting a sort of a package. You might come on a coach tour, for example. You might be with the same guide for three or four days, traveling around the south of Ireland or even further for a week or more, traveling all around Ireland. A lot of that itinerary is quite prescribed, so you'll see a lot of the touristy stuff, you know. And I don't want to complain too much about the touristy stuff. But I think we do have some great heritage here, but there are some definitely some sites that um, always get crowded with coach tours. People then might want to do something a bit more independent. So a lot of people will reach out to me for even just for a bit of advice or 
just looking at a good time to come, some places to see that might be maybe slightly lesser known. There are some people in Ireland that operate a strict service where they just design an itinerary for you, sell that to you as a package, and then you go and do all of those things on your own. But you tend to get a mix of people who are uh, sort of independent travelers or maybe will want to see a few things that are typical and then maybe want to see some things that are a bit off the beaten track. So you can you can talk to a tour operator. A lot of them are quite happy to design a, a tour that's specific for you that incorporates your interests. You can um, just do some independent research as well. There's loads of fantastic resources for Ireland, particularly nowadays with social media, things like Facebook and especially Instagram. You can get a sense of places in Ireland that you might not realise from talking to a tour operator or you might not see it in a travel brochure, for example. Uh, there's loads of great blogs so you can find out things about Ireland, about the city as well. And it's the kind of the things on offer are constantly evolving. So what was around last year might have changed to this year. There's always new things opening up. Uh, the whiskey industry is really coming back in, in a big way here in Ireland. So there's loads of little distilleries opening up that you can visit. Uh, so it's constantly evolving. There's loads of different sources out there. So like I said, you can reach out to somebody or you can do some uh, work yourself. It's not even too difficult to just arrive in Ireland and make things happen on the go. A couple of attractions book out in advance, but even all year round, it's, it's not too difficult to just queue up and get into some places. A high season, I wouldn't recommend doing it, but it's not impossible. That's interesting. So um, in terms of um, what you offer to, um, um, people, when, when they contact you, do you um, only take them, um, uh, your tours, um, strictly uh, um, in Dublin, or do you actually do stuff outside of the city as well? Uh, it, uh, it depends on who I'm, who I'm working with. I've w worked for some companies where you might be with a group for a few days and you're, you're taking them up and down the countryside, maybe to the Cliffs of Moher or somewhere. Um, at the moment, working for myself, I just have the means really to do tours around Dublin. I do know some drivers and things like that. So if someone was interested in a bit more of an extended regional tour, we could make that happen. And like I said, I've got the qualification now as a national tour guide. So I'm certified to guide all over the island as well. So uh, we could figure something out. I don't have the means to drive or show for myself now. That's kind of the next stage that I'm looking at. Uh, evolving into that over the next year or two where I could maybe have a luxury car and I could m make a trip that was a couple of days long but at the moment I'm mostly confined to Dublin or the, the broader Dublin region. So your, your Dublin tour would that be a walking tour then? Uh, yeah it's primarily on foot again there's been different um, requests depending on what some people will be interested in uh, I did a tour in December where somebody wanted to, they just kind of wanted me to escort them into some museums and some attractions. And we kind of just took some taxis in between the, the different places. Uh, most people would just want to stroll around Dublin for, for an, a couple of hours. I do an extended tour of Dublin, which is for people who are real history buffs. So I kind of try and apply my own background in history so that's it. that can be five hours walking around, but we'll take in some museums and things you might not normally do on a walking tour. And I usually try and include a meal at the end of the tour as well, where you can wind down, maybe reflect on any of the bits of the tour that you want to learn a bit more about. Uh, it's just kind of a nice way to finish off the day rather than sort of shaking hands and saying, well, I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, maybe I'll see you again in the future. It sets down some routes it establishes some friendships as well and i've really enjoyed doing those extended tours so i found that sometimes doing just group tours for random people who turn up you might have some people who really want to know everything and then some people who just want to walk around and take pictures and striking the right balance as a guide can can sometimes be a bit tricky so for people who want to pay the premium and do that kind of tour they really want to do the tour so it's, it's a real joy for me to do those as well so, uh, at a basic level i could just offer a, an orientation tour of dublin maybe two or three hours to show you major sites and uh, a, bit, a bit of the history a bit of the culture around that so i'm i'm generally flexible i kind of have uh, about two hours of a route and a content that sort of features on every tour but I can expand that up to five hours or change it depending on what people are interested in as well. 
So uh, I must most of it to assist the day tour or do people come uh, for extended period? Most of the tours will be just a day or even an afternoon or morning together. Um, yeah, it's kind of just one session really. So, so Alan, if I come to Dublin or to, 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 to Ireland and I contact them and say, look, I'm going to be, I'm going to be um, uh, uh, in Ireland for, uh, two, for, for 10 days and I'm going to have yeah. uh, three, two days in Dublin, um, can you can you you know show me a good time? Uh, what will you typically show me? If, uh, what what will you typically do? Uh, again, it would depend on what you're interested in. Dublin is a deeply uh, historical city, and one of the advantages of Dublin is you can quite literally see the evolution of the city from a little Viking settlement up to the modern times. Uh, we weren't great at conserving buildings, so a lot of our architect is quite mixed meshed so you can have literally a street layout that was designed by the vikings a thousand years ago but have some modern buildings on it from say the 90s as well so you get a sense of that ireland then famously was uh, colonized and ruled by uh, the english for about 700 years so going back to the 12th century up until the early 20th century as well so this is where you start to get castles so there's still some relics of castles and walls around the city of dublin uh, Dublin expanded greatly then in the 18th century. It's got some fantastic Georgian architecture around Dublin too, so you can see that kind of that period. And then famously we had a period of rebellion and independence about 100 years ago. At the moment there's a lot of centenary uh, events around the War of Independence here, so there's, uh, there's been a huge interest in that area of Ireland that maybe wasn't around a few years ago. So you can literally see everything from Vikings up to modern times, depending on what you're interested in. Dublin as well is a, a, history, a city that's famous for its uh, whiskey distilling, its beer brewing. A lot of that is coming back in a big way, just lots of little craft breweries opening, and um, particularly little whiskey distilleries. So if you're more interested in that side of things, there's plenty to see. Uh, there's a great live music scene in Dublin as well. The most famous one would be probably around the Temple Bar region, and that's that's good, but it can be a bit touristy. The places can get a bit crowded. Musicians are definitely performing for the crowd. That's not to say that they're bad or anything. They're always extremely talented. But there are other little places you can go where you'll get a mix of locals uh, taking part just in a music session, just for their own enjoyment. And things like that, I think, are, are a little bit more authentic. So you can see some of that sort of thing. Uh, it's a city that's really rich with literature as well. You'll know people like James Joyce, uh, Oscar Wilde, Simon Beckett. Uh, uh, for just to pick just a few famous authors from Dublin, there's several literary museums around that are just focused on that area of things. There's plaques in all the streets from uh, incidents in Ulysses, which is uh, James Joyce's novel based around the day in Dublin. So you can see how the city inspired some of that literature as well. We've got some fantastic parks here in Dublin. We've got one of the biggest wild parks in Europe. It's the Phoenix Park, where you can actually see wild deer living within the confines of the city. Uh, you can take a bike trip around the Phoenix Park as well. And Dublin is a coastal city, so even if you want to get a train for half an hour, you can go to the coastal village of Hoth, which is kind of like a headland that juts out from Dublin. There's a fantastic cliff walk that takes about two hours around there. You get some amazing seafood as well in that place. So there's a, a huge mix of things to do, whether you're interested in history, culture, literature, music, or even just food and drink. So there's plenty to keep you busy here in Dublin. It sounds, um, actually, uh, you, you, want, you want, I want to come to Dublin immediately and come, come have a look around <laughs> uh, again. <laughs> I'd be happy to meet you anytime, <laughs> just let me know. So Alan, what's the best time of the, uh, the year to actually come to Dublin? Uh, well, I think, uh, any time of year is, is, is nice to visit Dublin. There's advantages to coming in the high season and coming in the off season. Um, we tend to get some level of tourism all year round, which is quite good. And that's really only been the case for probably about three years or so. Uh, you get different people coming for different reasons. Maybe students studying in Europe might come in the winter to save some money or just looking for something to do on their uh, midwinter break. For example, if you come in the low season, uh, you'll have much easier access to a lot of the tourist attractions. 
one of the biggest attractions in Dublin is the Book of Kells, which is housed in the Long Room Library in Trinity College. Like it's extremely crowded during the mm -hmm. summer. And if you don't, if you don't book an advance ticket, you'll probably be in the queue longer than you'll be in the actual exhibition, which is uh, can be a bit of a disappointment. I mean, you can you can do the exhibition in about 20 minutes, but so, some of the year round, you're literally peering over someone's shoulder, trying to get a look at things. It can be very clammy and crowded, even if you go at nine o'clock on a Monday morning uh, between say May and August, it'll be really crowded. So coming in the off season gives you the opportunity to see some of the things uh, at a better pace. Then again, coming in the high season, the weather would be a little bit better. We don't really have extremes of weather here. It would drop to maybe zero degrees at the lowest point. And then on a good day in the summer, you might get in the low 20. So it, it doesn't jump a huge amount. It does rain a lot here in Ireland though. So even if you try and come in the summer, you could have a lot of rain. We've had a lot of rain for the last two weeks here as well. So that might inhibit some outdoor activity. There's more on offer generally during the summer as well. But even if you want to come in January, we have uh, the Temple Bar Trad Festival. So I mentioned the Temple Bar area of Dublin already. It's an area that's kind of known for its bars and its live music. But in uh, the Trad Festival in January, you get people playing there who might not normally play there. There's not usually kind of a circuit of musicians that play the same bars on certain nights, but they, they really throw the net wide and get a huge range of uh, traditional Irish musicians from all over. So that's something that you might see in the off season. Uh, kind of the sweet spot might be maybe April is, is a good time. In March, famously, we have St. Patrick's Day, which is a huge oh, day for tourism in Ireland. St. Patrick's Day is kind of where the tourist season really kicks off. So you get people who want to be here on St. Patrick's Day. You get people who want to be here near St. Patrick's Day to get a bit of the party atmosphere, but also avoid the big crowds. So either side of that, that weekend can be quite busy. But then you get a slight drop off in April, so things don't be tend to be as crowded in April. But the weather sometimes tends to improve a little bit. The weather on St. Patrick's Day, to give an example, it can be a day where you might not need a jacket, you might need a t-shirt, or you might have snow. So it's in that kind of mix <laughs> mix season. The weather events seem to be a bit more extreme in the last few years. The last few pa St. Patrick's Day have been quite cold. Uh, September is also another good time to visit. It's it's not hasn't gone too cold. You might still have some nice days here where you can walk about without the jacket. Uh, but the the high season is starting to come to an end. So again, some of the, the busier attractions, you might have a bit more breathing space to go in and, and enjoy them as well. But it's it's a place you can visit all year round. There's no there's no season where you can say like everything is closed or the roads are closed because of snow or anything like that. It tends to keep busy all year round. Sounds sounds awesome. So um, is there, are there any other services that you provide to people that come to Ireland except your tours in Dublin? Do, you, do your business provide any other services? At the moment, it, all I have the means to do is offer walking tours of Dublin. Like I said, I'm looking at expanding with some mm -hmm. other guides. We're able to give a huge amount away, but, uh, but some of the ideas we have would involve tours that might be more food and drink based or maybe kind of uh, storytelling. I'd like to get to the point where I can uh, have a luxury vehicle and expand, go beyond Dublin and travel around the region or even places as far away in different parts of Ireland. I mean, Ireland is small enough that in an emergency, there's nowhere you could travel on the island that you couldn't get back to Dublin within a day if you needed to. I think the furthest place away from Dublin is about a five hour drive. You know? So it's, it is quite small and very easy to get around if you have a private car. If you, mm relying on trains and buses it can be quite difficult because everything kind of sprawls out from Dublin and contracts inward so it can be hard once you start getting out uh, out of the Dublin area maybe to get from uh, I don't know say if you want to go from Galway to Belfast on public transport you, you're going to have to go through Dublin which is quite a bit of a detour yeah so I'd, I'd like to be able to offer that service and that's what I'm, I'm working towards over the next maybe two to three years Okay, cool. Um, and then the coronavirus, I mean, it forced everyone in the whole world basically to rethink their business models. Um, yeah. From a tour guide perspective, um, uh, you know, how has this impacted you? Are you? Do you have any 
bring any new ideas to you? And also, you know, for other businesses, uh, what do you think that the new things that people will do? Well, like I said, it, we're kind of we're changing almost every week with our understanding of the virus and the uh, parameters by which we're able to operate on under uh, the coronavirus hit Ireland just before St. Patrick's Day. So for the first time in many years, the St. Patrick's Festival was cancelled completely. Um, so it was, it was completely dead around that time. But you did have a lot of people who had already travelled into Ireland in anticipation of this as well. So over over the course of two or three days, we went from uh, like making big plans for tours to the main company that I do freelance work with effectively just shutting down until the crisis is over. So on that level, we, we really don't know where we're going to be. Um, it looked like we were going to start coming out of it, but we don't know what's happening with people traveling into Ireland. They're still keeping the, the two-week quarantine recommendation in place as well. And that's that's the reality we have to operate under. I, I, I'd rather wait until things were, you could, you could say with more confidence that things are going to be safer than take a risk on having large numbers of tourists coming in uh, at the moment so uh, on, on the grand scale tourism in Ireland I think is, is more or less coming to a halt now I've tried to uh, sort of change my tours to make them a bit more um, appealing to people who live in Dublin already so uh, I ran my first one yesterday it was uh, quite successful I had a small number of people there who were able to socially distance but what I tried to do was take them around the city and maybe tell them the history of buildings and places and streets they pass by all the time but they might not know um, where the street name came from or they might not be aware of some major significant events that took place in certain parts in certain buildings that you take for granted around Dublin as well so normally if someone is doing a tour here I'm kind of trying to explain that you know Ireland was established or Dublin was established by Vikings and then colonized by the Normans and the, um, or the English and then on what interpretation you take. Then we got independence, but we still have uh, two states on the island. We've got Northern Ireland and then the Republic of Ireland as well. So you, you, you're trying to explain some of these concepts to people. So I was able to assume that people take all of that for granted and just talk about some of the small details. So that seemed to work pretty well. And like in every city, it's kind of hard to get people who live there to maybe visit some of the attractions in their own city. Everyone is, is guilty of doing this as well. You, you go to see You're things right. when you travel, but it's it's difficult to see things in the city. So I'm kind of operating on a word of mouth basis for that, promoting it through Facebook ads that are targeted at people already living here. And push kind of promoting it as a, as a sort of an outdoor activity we can do here in Ireland. The whole thing takes place outdoors. We don't go in any museums or anything like that. So we'll see how that how that operates so that's my kind of what i have in mind for the next while but i'm not expecting big things from this i have my sights set on really building it up to launch for the high season next year so i don't think a whole lot's going to happen over the next couple of months in terms of tourism in Ireland. Um, again a lot of the bars are relying on the tourist trade so one of the bars that i uh, visit quite a lot i was in there yesterday for the first time just to uh, get something to eat and have a you know, chat with the manager. And he said almost all of the trade is coming from people who are just friends with the bar. They're, they're situated in a place where they would generally get a lot of tourist trade and they're getting hardly anything from that at the moment as well. So they're just about staying above above uh, water in terms of operating. But a lot of places might end up closing down over this. It, it really remains to be seen what's, what's going to happen. So I'm playing it cautiously, setting my sights on next year, just trying to build up build up a routine for myself i didn't want to just halt and then try and start it all over again next year when tourists come back i, I do genuinely love doing tours so i'm quite happy to do a tour for anyone who's interested so we'll try and get some locals interested in that for the next while and keep myself busy yeah so do you do, do you see um some um uh, uh, people visiting dublin as well from inside ireland that are not maybe not living in the city that could also be a potential um you know some potential business probably get people who are living in Dublin uh, taking domestic holidays in the countryside, trying to get mm. out of the city a little bit. So like about a third of the population live in Dublin, live yeah, in Ireland. Cool. It's, it's, a major, it's a major concentration of population. Other than that, all the cities are, are very spread out. There's no city in Ireland other than Dublin that has over a million people. 
living in Dublin and the surrounding area. Everywhere else is just a, a five, a six figure population. So people, I think if you're coming to Dublin, you're coming probably just for work related things anyway. So I don't know how many people will travel for something to do. I think people will probably rather stay in their own areas where there are fewer people around rather than go to a busier area, more concentrated mm. area of people in Dublin. Again, that's that's just my uh, my perception on it. It does make sense in mm. what you're saying. What yeah. about um, government assistance for businesses and especially for, I mean, uh, Ireland is such a big tourism country. Um, and how is that going? Do you get uh, government assistance? Um, what the government have done is they, they've given a payment of 350 euros for people who were in employment and lost a job as a result of the coronavirus. So they, um, th there was a bit of a, a rollback on that. They rolled it back for some people who weren't earning so much to about 200 euros. So that's still a little bit of a teething issue around that rate. So that was the main form of assistance that's been brought in. They brought it in quite quickly. They just said, if, if you lost your job, just apply for this. We'll give you the money into your account and then do do the background checks on it afterwards. You know, normally it can be quite mm. uh, quite difficult to access some of these uh, sort of social uh, social welfare payments and assistance payments in general. So that I think they recognised the scale of the problem and just knew that people will need a certain amount of money to get by week in week out. There are other uh, government grants. They're, they're paying wages for people who are in business who might be experiencing operational costs. But uh, they can avail of the government paying a certain level of the wages. That's not something that I'm directly involved in, so I, I'm not exactly sure of the figures on that. But tourism is a huge industry into Ireland, and there seems to be a little bit of tension between some of the tourist industries and the airlines, quite eager to start opening up again, and then people who are living here who are have been, uh, you know, quite dutiful, following the instructions, social distancing, wearing masks, uh, on the one hand, and then seeing that. There's a kind of a rush to get tourism off the ground again and without the proper checks in place. So um, there's a, a little bit of a tension. There's kind of questions around that in the media. A lot of commentary seems to be, um, mm. oh, well, we have to be very strict here, but why are we just allowing uh, tourism to come in without any proper checks, just operating on recommendations as well? So, Especially if tourism, uh, tourism still, are coming uh, from um, Irish countries, right? Or what is yeah. these Irish countries? Yeah, so um, play, certainly that there's a lot of traffic coming in from the United States as well mm. on airlines. I say a lot, like I, I don't have the figures to hand, but it, there's the perception that, that it's 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 opened up in a way that it, it hadn't for the last couple of months as well. So there's there's some assistance there already. It's again, it's kind of still evolving. We we only we had an election before the. Uh, outbreak of the virus and there was no clear winner in the election so it took a long time to form a government they've literally only just formed a government in the last two weeks and there's new people in charge of departments that weren't there a few weeks ago so there's still teething problems around this as well so like literally everything is just we'll wait and see what happens in the next two weeks so we're taking everything a small step at a time i think so there's so like to answer your question, yeah, there's there's some assistance there for small businesses for people who are out of work as well, but it's it's still uh, parts of it are still up in the air, so we're trying to figure it out. So Alan, it's been challenging times, um, and yeah. uh, your business is still quite young. But what is the most important thing you've learned so far in your business journey? Oh, it's, it's hard to tell, really. It's it feels it it doesn't feel like I've I've started a whole new business all of a sudden it just feels like i'm trying to make the most of what, what the situation is right now say things were going normally i probably would still be doing some freelance tour work and then trying to set this up on the side as well um i think word of mouth is, is very important tourism in general relies on consistently high reviews if you get if you get one review that can negate 50 uh, good reviews one bad review you know that's that that's the, that's the nature of it. So I'm just trying to um, get the name out, try and do a mix of paid sponsored ads, uh, organic shares, things like that. Um, I still I still very much just learning as as it's going along, trying to relate to the new reality we're in, seeing what 
people here in Ireland are interested in. But the real test is going to be uh, next year when it's hopefully tourism is opened up again and we're operating under some sort of normal conditions as well. But like I said, it might it might evolve into uh, forming a company with several other guys as well, maybe pooling our resources together. So um, I don't know, I'm, st I'm still trying to learn. I think the biggest lesson is just trying to be optimistic and open-minded about how I operate. Interesting. Alan, um, I have to press you. I have to give us your favourite Irish quote. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, you yeah, asked me about this uh, in advance and I was spending a couple of days thinking about it. Um, I think one of my favourite Irish quotes comes from uh, a guy called James Larkin, who was a socialist and trade union organiser here in Ireland about, about 100 years ago or so. Uh, before the period of the revolution, we had a period of a big strike here in Dublin that went on for several months between 1913 and 1914. So James Larkin was actually born in Liverpool to Irish parents and um, started organising from unions from originally from Belfast in the early 1900s, but he became kind of discouraged of the Dublin employers uh, in the early part of the 20th century. So he was able to try to get everyone to join one big union uh, at the time. So uh, the employers gave the workers an ultimatum, basically, to leave the union or you lose your job. Uh, so Larkin was responsible for some uh, mass rallies here in Dublin. But he had a great phrase. It was kind of borrowed from the sort of French revolutionary tradition, but he used it often in his speeches and phrases, the great only appear great because we are on our knees. Let us arise. So I think that's quite an inspirational quote. That's it's, an, uh, it's, it's an awesome quote, yeah. There's a, there's a statue of Larkin in O'Connell Street in Dublin, just across from uh, the General Post Office, which was uh, one of the main garrisons in a rebellion here in 1916. So Larkin's statue is outside. He's got his hands thrust in the air as if he's, uh, you know, agitating amongst the crowd. And uh, on the foot of the plaque, they have that quote as well. They have it in a couple of different languages. There's actually a little app you can get on your phone. So you scan the QR code on the statue and you can hear him speaking as well. So that's quite interesting. So yeah, I think that's probably one of the, the, my favorite quotes, just a nice inspirational thing that relates to the revolutionary tradition we have here in Ireland. Alan, it's been very interesting talking to you. Um, if your listeners uh, are planning a trip to Ireland or they want to get hold of you, yeah. how do they actually, um, how do people get hold of you? Uh, you can contact me directly through Facebook. I'm on Facebook as AB Tours Dublin. Uh, I'm also active on Instagram under AB Tours Dublin, and you can reach me at abtoursdublin at gmail.com. So I'll provide links to all, for all of those to yourself, and you can uh, put them up with the podcast if, if you like. Yeah, we actually will put them all in the descriptions and everything, so I'll get that from you. Great. I don't, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for spending the you time. You too, Will. I, it's a pleasure, and um, yeah, have a good day. Cheers, thanks very much. And hopefully we'll meet for a drink in Dublin someday. We definitely will. Thank you for listening to today's show. We are grateful for everyone listening to our podcast and to appreciate your interest in the beautiful country of Ireland. Please be sure to subscribe and follow us on all the links below. It would also be extremely helpful if you could share this show and all your links with your friends and family. Uh...